This is Lesson 23.1, Napoleon III in France. How did Napoleon III seek to reconcile popular and conservative forces in an authoritarian nation-state? College Board Topic 7.2, this is a big one, nationalism. Explain how the development and spread of nationalism affected Europe from 1815 to 1914. Nationalists encouraged loyalty to the nation in a variety of ways, including romantic idealism, liberal reform, political unification, racialism with a concomitant anti-Semitism, and chauvinism justifying national aggrandizement. A new generation of conservative leaders, including Napoleon III, Cavour, and Bismarck, used popular nationalism to create or strengthen the state. The place is France, and the time frame is 1848 to 1871. Key concepts of Napoleon III in France, nationalism and authoritarianism. Key people in Napoleon III of France, Napoleon III, of course, and Otto von Bismarck. From 1850 to 1914, nationalism and the nation-state gained lots of traction throughout Europe. Previous efforts before 1850 to create countries and independent nation-states were with people who had a common ethnicity, language, history, and territory. It had always failed before because only liberals really wanted it. But now there were government types that were promoting nationalism all over the social spectrum. How did this ideology become so institutionalized? Several ways and reasons. The answer seems to be the need for nations to survive rapid change. The change involved in industrialization, urbanization, political revolts and revolutions, and the social changes that we've talked about, class, family, lifestyle, culture, science. What might be one social constant that you can rely upon to institute some stability throughout all of this change? Ethnicity. Ethnicity changes more slowly than those other social factors. So the strategy that almost every nation in Europe turned to in order to juggle all these forces was mass ethnic identification with the nation state. We will see three things develop as nationalism institutionalizes and intensifies. Number one, the state will become more responsive to its citizens. It'll widen the voting franchise. It'll provide more social benefits. It'll provide more economic benefits. Number two, it will make greater demands of its citizens. It'll levy higher taxes. It'll demand military service. And number three, it will exploit their sense of patriotism to justify the exclusion of minorities at home, and to justify expansion overseas. The last time we looked at nationalism, it was before 1848. Napoleon Bonaparte had used national fervor in combination with the authoritarian state. In Germany, there had been a sense that Napoleon was able to roll through Germany because the German people didn't have a unified national defense. Nationalist aspirations didn't actually originate from ordinary grassroots people, but rather from educated, middle-class intellectuals. It was these people who wanted individual liberties for themselves to go along with their increasing social and political status. These were the ones who were being elected to assemblies in Berlin and Frankfurt and Stuttgart, not regular people. These were the ones who were creating and proposing new liberal constitutions with new rights and reforms. Many of these intellectuals saw nationalism as a means to this end, a means to bring about liberal and constitutional reform. Creating a strong sense of national identity in the people could serve to drum up popular grassroots support for a constitution that could embody that new nation for the people and contain the reforms that these middle-class intellectuals wanted. So nationalism could help these liberal intellectuals get the liberal constitutional reforms they wanted in the face of the current conservative order that was enforced by people like the Holy Alliance under Metternich and the police regime of the German Confederation. These intellectuals saw freedom for the nation and freedom for the individual as being closely tied. How can an individual be free if his nation isn't free? 
They also thought that nations would coexist happily and naturally if everyone got to have their own sovereign country. They hadn't necessarily seen a world in which these nations would compete vigorously and bitterly against each other. Louis Napoleon brought back his uncle's winning combo of authoritarian rule. This often wins because people want it. There's security in authoritarianism. You know what the rules are. And national feeling. The Second French Republic. Louis Napoleon's election. Why did an autocrat win by a massive 74.2% of the vote in December 1848? There was universal male suffrage in France. Louis Napoleon had wide support. He had his uncle's name. Napoleon Bonaparte's image had been blown up by romantics for decades. But in particular, Louis Napoleon had the support of the middle class and a property-owning peasant class. And these people didn't want all these non-property-owning voters messing with their property. And Louis Napoleon campaigned as a tough guy who was going to protect property. Louis Napoleon also had a nationalist vision for France. He saw French unity. He saw socioeconomic progress for France. And he communicated that vision effectively. For example, Louis Napoleon wrote a widely published essay called The Extinction of Pauperism. France was also a direct democracy. There was no electoral college. Representatives didn't elect the president, the people did directly. So Louis Napoleon's supporters could bypass the usual electoral hindrances such as corrupt politicians and special interests and the legislature. So Louis Napoleon could afford to be strong and authoritarian as long as the people were on his side. Louis Napoleon's coup d'etat, 1851. France was a republic with a constitution, and Louis Napoleon was legally obligated to share power with the National Assembly. The constitution limited any president to just one term. Well, it's hard to put a long-term vision into action when you can only have one four-year term. What Louis Napoleon needed from the National Assembly was this. He needed them to pay off his campaign debts, and he also needed a constitutional amendment allowing more than one term. What he offered the National Assembly in exchange was this, to let the National Assembly give the Catholic Church more control over the educational system, elementary and secondary education, and to let the National Assembly deprive many of the poor of the vote. The National Assembly didn't give him his constitutional amendment. So in December 1851, Louis Napoleon seized power. He dismissed the National Assembly. When you're an extremely popular politician, you have a unique opportunity to get away with breaking the law. You simply do it. You crush all opposition, and you make yourself look like the hero of the people with the message, well, I finally got rid of those bickering do-nothings in the legislature. Then you hold an election. You ask the people to vote to legalize what you've just done. And now you're legit. And this was exactly what Louis Napoleon's uncle, Napoleon Bonaparte, had done. The people voted to make Louis Napoleon president for a 10-year term. And one year later, he got the people to make him emperor for life. And now Louis Napoleon was known as Napoleon III. Napoleon III and France's Second Empire Louis Napoleon had great successes as France's Emperor Napoleon III between 1851 and 1871. The economy expanded. He had a vast railroad network constructed. He promoted banking investment. And as we already know, he improved Paris in a massive 20-year public works project. Unemployment declined. Profits increased, and wages increased. He let the National Assembly meet again, and he worked successfully with them, and he invited former political opponents to work for him. But Napoleon III had mixed results abroad. He had expanded France's overseas territories, and he also developed serious health problems. 
He competed unsuccessfully with Prussia for dominance in Europe, and he attempted unsuccessfully to create a second Mexican empire. As Napoleon III's health deteriorated, he increasingly gave up power to the National Assembly. He fought a disastrous war against Prussia, more on this later, and he himself was captured in this war. Prussian Chancellor Otto von Bismarck would not accept Napoleon III as Emperor of France anymore, and Bismarck arranged to have Napoleon III replaced. And Napoleon III went to live in exile in England. But before Napoleon III left power, he proved to the world that nationalism and authoritarianism could actually work well together. Before 1848, authoritarians like Clemens von Metternich had not been fans of nationalism. Nationalism had been seen as a means for getting authoritarians to concede to constitutions and liberal reform. It had been seen as a tool to use against authoritarians. But Napoleon III changed all that. He showed that authoritarians could successfully harness the power of nationalist feeling to their own advantage. So nationalism was no longer something that authoritarians had to fear. Instead, nationalism was something that authoritarians could use, cultivate, and institutionalize.